Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Right, my name is uh, Professor Basim Shaman. I'm a world religions professor at Boston <coughs> College. Uh, so obviously I teach world religions. That's the sponsor of this uh, event, the World Religion Club, that I'm also the advisor for. Um, we want to welcome you to this interfaith panel series. This is the third event that we've done as the club. Uh, focusing on is religion relevant in the modern world? The view from a Jewish, Christian, Muslim, and humanist perspective. Now, with us to assist in understanding the place religion plays in today's society, based on peace, justice, and the future of humanity with possible solutions, from each perspective, we have three distinguished religious leaders. Now, unfortunately, one of our speakers who represents the humanist perspective was not able to make it at the last moment, but we hope to invite him uh, to a future event where you can hear their perspective as well. Now, before I introduce our speakers, uh, and we have another speaker who is a little late, uh, he's on his way, I would like to provide you a reflection on the basis behind this event and other events being planned throughout the campus related to interfaith dialogue. Now, earlier this year, uh, the White House uh, in the Capitol introduced a very impressive initiative for campuses and universities around the country to really focus on the effort in building more interfaith dialogue, uh, respect, and acceptance among the different communities. And they wanted to start with uh, the college campuses as uh, the future leaders of our community. So let me uh, allow the President of the United States to tell us a little bit about it. For over 200 years, Americans of all faith traditions have come together, put their shoulders to the wheel of history, and made this country what it is today. And I know that as we go forward, it's going to take all of us, Christian and Jew, Hindu and Muslim, believer and non-believer, to meet the challenges of the 21st century. As a Christian who became committed to the church while serving my community, I know that an act of service can unite people of all faiths, or even no faith, around a common purpose of helping those in need. In doing so, we can not only better our communities, we can build bridges of understanding between ourselves and our neighbors. That's why, through the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, we're launching the President's Interfaith Service Challenge for college campuses and the neighborhoods that surround them. It's a pretty simple idea, and you can learn all about it at whitehouse.gov slash interfaith service. We're challenging students, administrators, and citizens to work together on year-long service projects that strengthen their communities and unite people across religious and cultural lines. We might build houses together, or organize community-wide clothing or food drives, or dream up a new way to address an issue that affects your neighborhood. But one thing's clear. While we may not all believe the same things, and we don't have to. We can certainly agree that together we can make a difference. So I urge you to take up this interfaith service challenge and show once again that the values that unite us as Americans are far more powerful <coughs> than those of the bias. And God bless. So during the current academic semester that we're in right now and into the spring semester, starting in January, uh, diverse entities within Criminal state have actually teamed up to actually answer the challenge that the president has offered colleges and universities around the country. And we're playing our part by uh, initiating different programs, and one of them is the program that you're in today. There'll be more of these interfaith panels in the future. Uh, there's, there have been multiple volunteer projects in the name of this challenge that has been uh, have been basically initiated uh, throughout this semester and into next semester. So today we have uh, three distinguished speakers. They will each have 15 minutes to present their view of the subject. And then we will open it up to your questions in the second hour. Now if, this is how the questions will be asked. Um, we have student volunteers who have index cards available. And Whenever you're motivated to ask a question, you can raise your hand if you don't have an index card that you picked up. You can write that question 
and then deliver back, deliver it back to the student world, where they will deliver it back to me. We will ask the speakers uh, a question to the best of our ability, and then we'll go all the way up to hopefully six o'clock. If we go a little bit uh, further, that's fine. We have you know, room all the way up to seven. Hopefully, we don't want to go that long to respect the time of the speakers. So let me first introduce um, Rabbi David Kay, who serves Congregational Ohev Shalom in Maitland and is the interfaith liaison for the Greater Orlando Board of Rabbis. Rabbi Kay was ordained by the Rabbinic Board of Rabbis, and he is also um, ordained by the Rabbinical School of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in 2002 and has been an assistant rabbi at Ohev Shalom since 2004. Next to him is Reverend Brown Fulwater. Reverend Fulwater is a native of California. In 1978, he moved to Arkansas to pursue an undergraduate degree and then to Denver, Colorado for his master's degree. He holds a BA in English Literature and a minor in History from, from John Brown University in, uh, is it Salem Springs? Siloam Springs, Arkansas, and a Master of Divinity degree from the Ellis School of Theology in Denver, Colorado. In partnership with a psychotherapist in Little Rock area, Paul, Reverend Paul Water, was the co-founder of the Leadership Group, a consulting firm which works with congregations, community organizations, and businesses in the areas of leadership development, creating healthy work communities, understanding and dealing with triangulation and conflict from a Darwinian family system perspective and developing mission statements and visioning work with organizations. He completed two years of specialized training and research work in systems theory with Dr. Edwin Friedman at the Center for Postgraduate Studies in Family Systems located in Bethesda, Maryland. He serves as uh, and has served in a number of ways beyond the local church, including past chair chairperson, Arkansas Interfaith Alliance, past president, Arkansas Interfaith Impact, trustee and past president, Arkansas Interfaith Conference, past chair and board member of the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, pastoral care board, advisory board, the Lion White Center, chairperson, the Interfaith Council of Central Florida, Life Trustee, Chicago Theological Seminary, Advisory Board, Clinical Pastoral Education Program, Florida Hospital, Past Board Chairperson, and Current Board, board Member, the Mayflower Retirement Center of Winter Park. And finally, he is a contributing author to an intellectual history of the Ellis School of Theology, Theology, published in 1992, and is currently co-authoring It's Not About Bear Hunting, A Journey in Adventurous Leadership. Brian and his wife Marilyn made their home in Central Florida, and he has two of his own sons. Our third speaker is Imam Muhammad Musri, and he is the president and senior Imam of the Islamic Society of Central Florida, which includes 10 mosques, a full time accredited school, K 12, a child care center, a social services organization, and an interfaith outreach department, which provides hospital and prison chaplains and partners with various faith communities to promote peace and respect among all people. He served for four years as the co-chair of the Interfaith Council of Central Florida, and he has a weekly TV program called Islam, and is regularly interviewed by local, national, and international TV, radio, and print media. Imam Musri is a regular lecturer on Islam, Islamic law, and the culture of the Middle East at various colleges and universities. He was first appointed by Governor Jeb Bush as a member of the Florida Governor's Faith-Based Advisory Council and was reappointed by Governor Charlie, Charlie Crist, as well as the Governor's Complete Count Committee for the 2010 Census for the State of Florida. So help me welcome all of our distinguished speakers. So as I mentioned, each speaker will have uh, 15 minutes to present their view about the topic, is religion relevant in the modern world? And uh, hopefully Imam Shri will be here soon. So we'll start with uh, Rabbi. Yeah, sure. 
Good evening. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, uh, Gotham and uh, World Religions Club, for sponsoring this uh, important discussion. Um, representing the Jewish tradition is um, a little bit of a joke because, as with every faith tradition, um, there are as many different denominations as there are perspectives to have uh, on a particular faith tradition. But I can provide a, a, a general overview. Um, first of all, first of all. Uh, you know, the, the question of relevance, of course, we could, we could make this a really short evening, and I could just say, is religion relevant in the modern world? I could just say yes, um, and I'm sure uh, my colleagues would agree with me, and that would be it. We could, you know, we could go have dinner and we'd all be done with it. But um, the question that usually gets asked about to religious leaders eventually, the one that you, that is inevitable and, uh, um, you know, I was going to say and that you dread, but you don't really dread it, is why do I need religion? Isn't it just important for me to be a good person? And the answer to that question is, yes, of course, it's important for you to be a good person. And do you necessarily need to have a particular faith tradition, or, or specifically my faith tradition, to be a good person? No, you don't. Um, any sincere faith tradition points you towards being a good person. Any sincere uh, commitment to compassion, we had our our humanist, uh, uh, our humanist brother or sister here, they would tell you you don't need the structure of a religious tradition in order to achieve that same end. You just need to be committed to those principles. But I would suggest that, in a way, um, humanism, just like any other religious faith tradition, is within the broadest definition of what a religion is. And I'm not trying to say that you know, humanism is religion, therefore we don't who think they don't, ha ha, that's not, that's, not, that's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that there are many different ways to reach that goal of a just and peaceful world, um, and no one of them is necessarily any more valid than another, depending on who you are. Okay. Um, again, this doesn't sound like I'm, I'm giving you a specific perspective of Judaism, but I am, because Judaism has, from its earliest days, been uh, the technical term that's used by some scholars is henotheistic, that we worship a single, unified, eternal, universal God, um, which, for which we feel a particular structure of obligations um, in fulfilling that worship, um, and we also leave room for other peoples, other individuals, other groups, to have their own way of achieving that, and that's equally valid for that group of people. Okay. Um, it's the, uh, the, in the Taoist tradition, um, and maybe it will seem a little bit odd for me to be invoking the Taoist tradition to describe Judaism, but nevertheless, um, I'm involved in interfaith work. In the Taoist tradition, the saying is there are 10,000 doors in one destination. Um, that's pretty much the way that Judaism looks at the world. My door is the one that's marked Judaism. Um, someone else's door will be marked Christianity. Someone else's will be marked Islam. And uh, behind that door, there will be a number of other doors, um, different denominations, whatever. They all lead in the same direction. That's the point. Um, the overarching point being that the problem is not religion, just like the problem is not government, or the problem is not money, or the problem is not politics, or the problem is not um, one particular political party. The problem is people and the way people behave. Anyone can take a good idea and do something bad with it. Um, so those who would say Jude, that, that uh, religion is at the cause of most of the problems in the world, indeed you can trace almost all of the major problems in the world and in human history to religion, are right in the sense that technically things have been done in the name of religion, or in the name of God. Um, but if you take it a little bit farther, it could have been anything. People have made those same kinds of choices and actions in the name of nationalism, in the name of patriotism, in the name of politics, in the name of economics. Ideas by themselves aren't necessarily good or bad. How they're put into action is what matters. Um, so the relevance of religion in uh, um, in, in our modern world is the same as the relevance of religion at any point in human history. 
it's just as good as the practitioners who put it forward. And it's just as positive or negative as we want to make it in the way that we apply it. Um, from the Jewish perspective, as Jews, we are obligated in 613 commandments, as laid out in the five books of the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Um, a lot of those are really easy to fulfill because they're negative commandments. They're the thou shalt not kind. Okay, so right now I'm not, you know, I, I'm not stealing, I'm not murdering, and I'm not committing adultery. Therefore, that's three right there that I'm fulfilling just by standing here and talking to you. Um, and there are a couple of hundred more just like that that I'm refraining from at this very moment simply because I'm here doing something else instead. And hopefully in the rest of my life I'm refraining from those things as well. Um, there's this other couple of hundred that are the active ones where I'm obligated to do certain things. Uh, and the general attitude is that there aren't certain ones that are more important than others, but there really are. Those that have to do with our relationships with other human beings are the ones which are more important or more pressing than, say, the strictly ritual ones. Um, so you can follow all the dietary laws to the very last letter of the most stringent interpretation, um, and that doesn't make you a good Jew. What makes you a good Jew is how you treat other people um, and how you take on the rest of your your understanding of your religious obligations. Um, but you can't have one without the other. Uh, and it doesn't make you uh, better than somebody else if you are more meticulous about ritualistic things and not as meticulous about the interpersonal things. Um, Judaism also suggests that uh, um, every misdeed towards another person is a misdeed toward God as well. So is there a relevance there? I, I think so, because we're, we're not just saying that you should just be nice to people because it's nice to be nice to the nice, and they'll be nice to you, and we'll all be nice to each other, and everything will be fine. Um, we're also saying that there is a greater moral and ethical imperative. Um, you can call it God if you want to. You can call it something else if you want to. Um, um, I choose to call it God. There is this greater moral and ethical imperative which guides all of my choices. Um, so at those moments, what, what's the value of that? Why do I need religion, personally, speaking for myself, why do I need religion when all I have to do is be a good person? Because I need a system that helps me make those decisions. Uh, that is something which we find typically lacking when we encounter injustice in our community, in our nation, in our world. We encounter um, uh, disruptive forces, violence, war. Missing is this, uh, I guess the popular term now is moral compass, but not so much moral, because in my understanding of it anyway, uh, morality is a lot simpler than ethics. Morality is, is right and wrong. We know that if we break into somebody's house and take their TV set, that's wrong. We don't need a religious structure. We don't need a, uh, um, a, a philosophical structure. We don't even really need a set of laws to tell us that's wrong. Going into somebody's house and taking their stuff, you know, inherently, bad move. Don't do it. It's wrong. If you're doing it, you know you're doing something wrong. You feel bad about it. You know, you, you justify it whatever way you do. Um, it's those moments where we're not exactly sure which of the possible right choices, moral choices, is the appropriate one for that context. That's where we're really challenged. That's where we hesitate, that's where we hang up, that's where we're concerned that we're going to do the wrong thing, even though it feels like there's a good reason for doing it. We don't know which choice to make. Those are the ethical dilemmas, and that's where religious faith traditions move in to help us find a direction. So um, uh, matters of justice, we may say, look, I can point to passages in the Hebrew Bible that say, you know, you're supposed to put people to death when they do certain things. So therefore, 
um, if I'm feeling this twinge of doubt about uh, uh, the, the death penalty as it is in the modern world, um, I could look at my source text and say, but it says it in the Hebrew Bible, therefore it's beyond my control. Or I can think about it a little more deeply and say, wait a minute, under what circumstances was that being imposed? Read the whole thing, read the full context. Um, a lot of people like to point to the Hebrew Bible and say, you know, there's a lot of uh, fire and brimstone here. There's a lot of punishment. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of, you know, people getting plagues and, and, and fire from heaven and stuff like that. But when you get right down to those, those justice questions, there's more detail than you may realize. For example, and I got myself in big trouble, the first sermon I ever gave to a rabbinical student, um, I got myself in deep trouble. Um, now, now I will let you know how old I am. Um, or when I started, when I started studying uh, um, way back when, um, the O.J. Simpson trial was going on. Okay, for some of us, there are people in the room who are going, O.J. Simpson. Oh, there was a Family Guy episode about him. Um, the O.J. Simpson trial was going on, the first one, the murder trial, not the, uh, uh, not the subsequent trial. And um, I gave this sermon where I said, you know, if Jewish law prevailed in the United States of America, the O.J. Simpson trial would have been over in six seconds. Because Jewish law requires, Torah law requires, that you have to have two eyewitnesses, both of whom independently tell the same story. There were no eyewitnesses, therefore there couldn't be a death penalty. End of, end of question. There could be other punishments, there could be other repercussions, but death penalty should be off the table right away. Um, and I got in so much trouble for saying that because people, had, some people dragging me aside saying, you know, are you saying that we should get away with murder? And other people who are saying, you know, are you saying that he's, you know, he's innocent, and it's an innocent will prove guilty? But, uh, so I, what I learned from that experience, by the way, personally, was don't talk about controversial topics um, until later on. Um, uh, or be ready to take the consequences. At any rate, um, uh, I see that as just one example of the relevance of religion in, in contemporary times. Um, whereas you might look at that biblical text and say, you know, there's a lot of anger and punishment. If you read it a little more carefully and put it into its full context, and you look at the full context of the subsequent three or four thousand years of interpretation and practice within Jewish tradition, um, you see things like 2,000 years ago or so, the rabbis of the Talmud saying, um, actually, death penalties, the death penalties were never or very, very rarely enforced. Why? Because we're human beings and we can make a mistake. It's the only penalty that can't be reversed. So um, you have one source saying that a rabbinic court which handed down and, and carried out a death penalty once in a generation was called a court of, uh, a court of murderers. Because how could they be so sure? How could they take on their, on their own shoulders the responsibility for another human life, taking it away and be sure that they have made a mistake? Okay? Um, those are the kind of principles which guide sincere faith traditions and which point towards justice and peace and equality and the sort of things that we all agree religions should teach. And they, and they do. Um, so, what is the relevance for us as practitioners of faith? Uh, obviously, we believe that our faith traditions have something to say today, just as they have had things to say that are important to all humanity for a number of centuries. What's its relevance now and moving forward into the future? I think it's safe to say that it gives us a basis by which to take those most noble teachings of whatever faith tradition or no faith tradition of humanism or philosophy or whatever and put them into action. To frame them in a sacred context and to say mostly to our own selves that the obligation that we have towards each other is a sacred obligation. It's a, it's a word people kind of shy away from sometimes. They don't talk about saying that sacred holy. It sounds like something, you know, that's for church, that's for synagogue, that's for mosque, that's for, you know, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever your particular day is, but the rest of the time, I don't want to think about things as being holy, I want to be able to do what I want to do. Except, the relevance, I think, the important message is, everything you do is holy. The question is, are you fulfilling your behavior? Are you doing the things that 
fulfill and uphold the holiness of your humans. Well, we did that. Good to be here. Good to see all of you. It's a nice school today. Thank you for patient for inviting me to come. Alex, always good to be with you. Is religion relevant? No. No. It's not relevant. Unless it's relevant for you. And the way I think religion becomes relevant to the individual is that it actually has some effect on the bearing of your life. <coughs> it gives you some sense of meaning. Religion, per se, the word, the idea of religion, is simply the idea that one adheres to a certain set of principles, beliefs, ideas, and practices. So, for instance, you get up in the morning, you hang your feet over the edge of the bed, you wiggle your toes a little bit to make sure everything's still functioning, you get up, you either make your way to the coffee pot or the teapot or the water pitcher or the juice or whatever, or maybe to the bathroom to brush your teeth, or whatever your first activities are, those are rituals. Those are activities that you do every day. One might say you're religious about getting up, and the way you get up has some religious practice to it, some regular, ritualistic, same kind of practice day in and day out. So, what are you religious about? Um, how many people here would self-identify as Christian, for instance? Anybody self-identify as a Christian here? We won't tell anybody, so it'll be a secret. We won't out you, I promise. Anybody self-identify as uh, Jewish here? Anybody self-identify? There's one, one, uh, one admits to Judaism. Good. It's good. The rabbi should, don't you think? Yeah, I think that one. Anybody uh, self-identify as Muslim here? Anybody? Oh, one. The imam, that's good. Anybody else? Uh, anybody? Oh, there's, there's another. Okay. Anybody self-identify as, uh, as Hindu here? Anybody? Kind of practice the Hindu way. How about Buddhism? Anybody practice Buddhism here? There you go. So, Buddhism. so and there are other 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 religions that I didn't mention. Did you just identify anybody? Other religion? But no religion. Who identifies as no religion? Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So very good. All right. So we've got a sense of the fact that that in a, in a very real sense, everybody identifies in some way, right? Either with a particular religion or with no religion, but we identify. What's the identification of that religious um, understanding? Does it have to do with, with primarily beliefs for you? Is it, is it about the things that you believe? That's probably one thing. How about practice for anybody? Does it have to do with what you practice? things you do that important. Ritual, we talked about earlier, you know, sort of doing things religiously. There are certain rituals within most every religion or non-religious practice. So religion is not relevant unless it's relevant to us, unless it means that we <coughs> shape our lives in some way based on that religious understanding. So let me talk about Christianity for a moment because I, I, can't, I can't talk with any kind of authority about anything else and I can't talk with much authority about Christianity because the notion that there is sort of one Christian understanding is simply not the case, right? I mean, if you self-identify in this room as a Christian, um, you know for a fact that when you sit down and talk with other people who self-identify as Christians, you probably have some seriously different perspectives on things. Is that fair to say? That if you talk to 
any group of Christians, or if you're sitting with a group of Christians and you're listening to them talk, even if that's not your own um, self-identification religiously, that you find there's a lot of diversity, or you turn on the news, or you look at what's being written in the paper, or you just listen to different conversations going on, and you find that people who call themselves Christians disagree on lots of things. They disagree on social issues um, in considerably diverse ways. They disagree on basic beliefs in a whole set and series of ways. They disagree on practices. I was with a group this morning, several years ago, I decided, I'll take my coat off if you don't mind. Several years ago, I decided that I would, um, that I would spend some time with um, other Christian clergy because I didn't do that very often. I spent a lot of time, have spent a lot of time in interfaith work and done a lot of work with clergy from other traditions like my uh, colleagues here and many others. But I found myself not connecting very much with people within the Christian tradition. And I thought, well, since I am a, a you know clergy person in that tradition, maybe I ought to spend a little time with other clergy. So I started this thing where I invited some friends to just come and have breakfast once a week. Um, and we just sit down and talk. No, no agenda particularly Christian clergy. So this morning there was a Roman Catholic priest, there was a Seventh-day Adventist uh, pastor, and there was a, a minister out of the Disciples Christian Church tradition. And me, my background is in the United Church of Christ, UCC Congregationalism. So four of us from different traditions sitting there. It was fascinating to hear the, um, the Roman Catholic priests particularly talk about what makes you a um, Catholic in terms of that understanding for the purpose of marriage. What makes you a Catholic if you live in, um, you know, you, you're, you're going to live in a parish, okay? So if you're a Catholic, you, you don't go join a church particularly. You are a member of the church in your parish. You can go any place you want to, but you, you have kind of an already automatic membership in that parish. And if you want to get married, what they're going to ask you in most Catholic churches, does anybody know this? Are you practicing? Are you a practicing Catholic? Okay, that's a, a pretty interesting idea. In other words, are you involved in such a way that you are regularly taking, you know, participating in the sacrament, coming to the communion or the Lord's table in that tradition given within that context? Um, are you involved in the in the um, in the activities of the parish of the local congregation? And do you you know do you participate in the other kinds of um, sacraments of the church like confession and so on and so forth? And you can kind of identify how you would how you would locate yourself as a practicing Catholic, but they want to know that you think of yourself as a practicing Catholic to be married in the church. And I thought that was just fascinating because the issue for religion and faith is about practice. Um, where we get caught so often is on the issue of belief. And it seems to me that within Christianity, one of the things that has happened, um, and it happened very early on in the Christian tradition, is that we slipped into a sort of notion about what were considered non-negotiable beliefs within Christianity. Um, so that non-negotiable beliefs became things like um, one's understanding of um, pro-life or, or a woman's um, choice around those kinds of issues. Or non-negotiable issues became issues of sexual orientation within uh, certain traditions. Or non-negotiables became issues of your God language, your God talk. You talk about God in the male pronoun sort of way. God is a he, the man who you only think about God as father and so on. Um, non-negotiables became issues of um, the relationship of women to leadership in the church. In many cases, those became non-negotiables. The interesting thing is, none of those things identified as non-negotiables are not negotiables in terms of Jesus. Um, if you look at the, at least the Testament, the, the, the Christian Testament of Scripture around Jesus, there's a whole different set of non-negotiables. 
For instance, if you just read the Beatitudes out of chapter 5 of Matthew and the Sermon on the Mount, one non-negotiable that you just can't argue against is the idea of non-violence and peace. That Jesus was about non-violence and peace. And there are very few Christian traditions that would say that's a non-negotiable. We can't, we can't let that go. In fact, churches often are sort of propelling um, the opposite of that. Uh, very much uh, uh, promoting ideas of uh, war and nationalism and that sort of thing. That, uh, um, and, and, and accepting the fact that violence is just a part of life and we have to participate in it. And basically Jesus said that's not acceptable. That, 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 that faith is about living out a peaceful and non-violent life with each other. That would be a non-negotiable with Jesus. It was jettisoned probably in about 313 um, during what we call the Constantine Edict where where the, 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 the illegal religion of Christianity of, of the Roman Empire, Judaism was also illegal at the time, they were called religio illicitis, illegal religion, where Christianity became the, the, the religion of the realm. It became the accepted religion, and in fact the required religion, and it was, it was used <coughs> as a way to sort of bond together um, the various um, the various entities of the Roman Empire at the time. And, and quickly, we had to dispense with the idea that nonviolence and peace were a core, uh, core part of the message of Jesus. Um, the message of Jesus around forgiveness, uh, for instance, and love of enemies, um, that's, a, that's, that's, that's deeply rooted in the material around the New Testament. But we find that, that those are not often considered to be part of the core message of, of much of the Christian faith often, or too often, sadly. I think we talk about the radical forgiveness, the idea of loving one's enemies, is a very strange notion when you, when you think about it. I mean, we, we, it's, a, it's a weird idea, um, but it's a core message within, within the, the, the message of Jesus. Another core message of Jesus um, would be the idea of um, generosity to the poor and justice. These are, these are clearly page after page of, of um, conversation, commentary, parable about that kind of thing. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was sick and in prison, you came and visited me. Um, and, and, and the story is in Matthew 25 that those who are listening say, when did I do that? And Jesus said, when you did it to one who was considered the least among um, the community, you did it to me. Somebody who's been outcast and, and sent off to the fringes and oppressed. When you've done this to, to folks who are poor and oppressed, you've done it to me. It's a core understanding, this kind of generosity of the poor and justice understandings, but they are lost in much of Christianity today. And finally, radical inclusion rather than exclusion, the message of bringing people in. Jesus never excluded anyone. It's very interesting. He, he, he often called, um, you know, called kind of what was going on by truth, but he didn't say, and therefore, you know, you're out. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm excluding you from the possibility. There's always the possibility of transformation and change in new life within that message. So those core ideas, um, which, which are at the heart of Christianity and of, of the teachings of Jesus, are often and largely lost in the, in the message today. Um, so what we find, I think, in, in, this, in this work that we do of asking the question of the relevance of religion is really um, is really important in the sense of asking what kind of religion is going to be relevant. If there's going to be a relevance of religion for the 21st century, how is that going to be shaped? And I think it will have the principles, because all of these principles, I say, are the core of what Jesus taught, are also at the core of what um, every one of the religions today and every major world religion really teaches in terms of faith understanding. And as far as, as far as the Christian approach goes, um, we, we have an awful lot of tendency, I think, within my tradition 
to, to worry about right ideas rather than who it is that we're relating to and, and, and how we're living our lives in relation to each other. And that's really kind of the, the, the base issue of good religion, of relevant religion, is how does it change our relationship to make it more holistic, more life-giving, um, more, more energized around love and compassion and hope and peace. There's a great poem by Adam Stern Kennedy who talks about Jesus in this poem. It says, when Jesus came to Galilee, they hung him on a tree, they drove great nails through hands and feet and made a calvary. Red were his wounds and deep, those were crude and cruel days, and human life was cheap. When Jesus came to some of the old community college, we merely passed him by. We never heard a hair of him, we only let him die. For folks had grown more tender, they would not cause him pain. They only just walked down the street and left him in the rain. And I think that this calling of faith, this relevance of religion, is about seeing each other um, and seeing the potential of serving God in the other, um, in the neighbor, no matter who they are, um, no matter their situation and finding a way to reach out in compassion and love and kindness for um, uh, all that we are. Thanks. Well, I have very little to add. <laughs> they have done a great job in describing the fact that religion is relevant. It, it plays a significant role in our lives. Uh, I want to use a few analogies to illustrate what we're talking about. While religions can be described like schools, or universities, or colleges, each one offering some of the same courses, and we all, and that's why you're here and you're, you're going to school, we all believe that education is good, and if you are educated, your mind will be opened up, you will understand the world better, you will be civilized, you will get a better job, uh, you will be able to coexist. There are so many benefits for going to school, that's why we go through the trouble. We pay money, we go attend classes, go through tests, stay up all night studying, doing homework and projects because we believe there is value in education. And religion is education. It's a system while religion itself basically is the same because we all as human beings we need that education. It has different schools. And these schools, are like different great universities, have different offerings. And uh, they start at different times. Some like the Ivy schools uh, are ancient, and some are more contemporary. But the basic point, when you enter one of these religions, you commit yourself to a system where you say, I want to be educated. I don't know it all. I expect to be educated. The teachers within that school, within that, within that religion, going to help me understand the world better and relate to others better and find my calling in, in life to do something positive. So, and I know sometimes some schools or some teachers or professors within the school don't do a good job, but that doesn't mean the entire school is. You know, Penn State has been in the news lately, not because somebody in the you know sports arena has uh, done something wrong. That means academically, this this you know, Penn State is not a good school. It is an excellent school. And within every religion, there are some bad teachers or bad students okay, that bring bad name to that school. And then people say, we don't need these schools. 
We don't need Penn State. We don't need, you know, the Catholic Church. We don't need Islam. We don't need any religion. But the fact is, we continue to have no schools and no people in Northern schools because deep inside our hearts we know they have great doubt. Now, what these religions offer is the wealth of several thousand years of human heritage that has been developed when there are lives over thousands of years and priests and ministers and imams and thinkers and scholars have really focused on issues and you know developed opinions and debated these opinions back and forth. That wealth, that human wealth, cannot be neglected in our journey to solve future problems. Because all the challenges that face us today or will face us in the future have you know, similarities in the past. Human beings, you know, repeat the same uh, patterns in their lives. And even though we think today the economic challenges we have today is unique, but those who are old enough, you know, our grandparents, they tell us back in the late 20s, early 30s, we went through a great depression. Similarities are tremendous. Stock market crash, you know, uh, our politicians didn't know what to do about it, and we found ourselves in a great depression. And right now, some people forecast if we don't do the right things, we may end up there again. Despite all of our experience after the first one, all the studies that have been done. But what caused the first one and, and this one, even if we don't call it the Great Depression, is moral decay, greed at all levels, from me, the individual who want to, you know, borrow on my credit cards and, and borrow from banks to you know, finance one and two and three homes, all the way to the top CEOs of these banks who, you know, uh, found a legal loophole and went ahead and dragged this nation and the world into the abyss. Who is going to tell me as the individual, the borrower, and who's going to tell the decision makers, be it on Wall Street or on uh, Main Street, that this is wrong, this is bad, you shouldn't do this. You know that. Only from the inside. If we have a belief in higher being, in higher system, if we pledge ourselves to a certain ethical code to say, it's me, it's who I am, I will never violate this, I will never lie, I will never cheat, I will never, even if the, the money is sitting on the table, it's not my money, I will never take it. But if I have no conscience and no internal uh, compass that tells me this is wrong, then I can do anything. And I don't worry about it because I can find a loophole legally, I can get away with it. And a lot of people today should be in jail who caused this misery for millions of Americans. But we can't do anything about it because human law is often, you know, flawed. And there are humans who can beat the system. They can find those rules. When we think and talk about hiring, about God, we're not talking about something <coughs> You know, there is plenty of scientific evidence today. That's why <coughs> billions of people around the world believe in God. It's not just because it's tradition or habit. It's because they also they have they have scientists who actually can prove the existence of God. You know, but we act as human beings like 
uh, young kids or young teenagers, rebellious. We don't want to recognize the authority of our parents, even though we know we came to life through them. And even though we live in their house and we say, no, I'm going to break the laws that my parents have set for me. And because my parents are loving and compassionate and forgiving, and uh, let me sometimes go get away with it, I just feel tempted to do even more, to push my limits. Until I break the law, I get arrested, something happens on the outside, and parents say, I told you. Now, let's not mistake in God's love and compassion for what he created, as that there is no God and there is no law and there is no system. There is a system. There is a God. But God gave us the freedom to live by a system. And he said, here is multiple versions of this system. You have it every so often, you know, to different parts of the world, the system was revealed through some teacher, some prophet. And you notice that all of these religions have so much in common. They believe in the same commandments. They believe in the same God. They believe in the same general system. But within each tradition, within each denomination, within each church, synagogue, mosque, we will have individuals within a family who have, you know, different opinions on the details. And that's that's fine. But we cannot deny the entire system because of that. So if we are aspiring for a future that has peace and justice in it, we have to look back at what vehicle, what system will get us there. We all need to work on it, right? So after World War II, after human beings killed each other, and six million of our Jewish brothers and sisters were uh, killed. And that's, by the way, how, how percentage-wise of the Jewish world population, it's not like six million Muslims out of 1.6 billion. This is, at the time, maybe half or more. It is unthinkable what human beings can do to other human beings. And after that happened, we said, no way, no more. But look what happened in Rwanda, in Burundi. What happened in Darfur. What's happening all the time? Bosnia and Herzegovina. Human beings are going back to that. So, even though we created the United Nations, we brought all the nations of the world, and we said, we're going to stand together, we will never accept injustice, we will work for peace, we'll have you know, forces on the ground to secure the peace. Now I'm about to do the work. Because it's not something external we have to do, it is internal. As both of my colleagues said, it is here, it's relevant to you. It is my decision if I will follow the system, follow the law, follow my moral compass and say this is right and this is wrong. And that's what religion is about. So in our endeavor to, to create a new system, human system, not based on any religion, but to come up with a system to guarantee future peace of the people of the world, we find ourselves you know, harming ourselves to the teeth with nuclear weapons that could wipe us all off this planet. We find ourselves spending in this country over five hundred billion dollars on and annually on on defense and neglecting education, neglecting our health care. So our priorities are not really aligning with our dreams of having peace and justice. But when we look at the system that has been given to us, 
by our creator and has been developing over thousands of years by scholars and jurists in all these schools, we find the answers already there in the Golden Rule. Love for your brother what you love for yourself. Do to your brother what you like them to do to you. It cuts across all religions. That's what God wants us to do. Like a parent wants to see all of his children, you know, working it out, loving and, and you know, helping each other rather than competing and fighting and uh, killing one another. So having a system that's there that we answer to and we commit ourselves to and we say, because I belong to this system, because it, it is who I am, that is your guarantee. It's not the police that stops me from doing a lot of things. Most people in this country are not doing crimes, not because of law enforcement, not because of any laws on the books. It's because of their belief, because of their character, because of they believe in God. They believe in what God said. And that is a powerful evidence of the need for religion, whichever school of thought it is. Peace comes when we all see ourselves as children of God, and that there is one God, and that we all have the same rights, not just as Americans, but as human beings. What I don't accept to happen to me and you here in the States, I won't accept it for someone else you know, in China, or Russia, or anywhere. Why? Because I love my country, but I love God and I love everybody that was created by God. Everything that's created by God. I love the trees, the animals, every creation out there. It's also my brother and sister. And I have to care for them as such. And I believe that when I do care for them, I get rewarded. And when I uh, fail to care for them or further cause damage to any human, any creature out there that I'm transgressing my limits in that grand law. So even if I don't, nobody can get to me legally in this life, I believe God will eventually, even if after. Justice cannot happen with that. I mean, peace cannot happen without justice. And justice is, throughout these religions, have been spoken about again and again. The Golden Rule and similar rules that point out the rights of everyone. Why there is turmoil in, in our country and the world today? Because people have a sense there is no justice. The Occupy Wall Street folks to the 99%, they feel, where is justice? Why is it that we bail out the banks and the banks are taking us out of our hands? Where is justice? When people develop a sense that there, there is injustice, it will lead to conflict. People want to restore fairness and justice. They will not accept it. So there is no peace without justice. And if we're not just as a nation to other nations, those nations will gang up, us, gang up on us. Yes. So we have to really understand that uh, religion may have gotten a bad name, like any school getting a bad name because of a teacher or a bunch of teachers there. But it is not the fault of the school. Look at the tradition of any school that has graduated thousands and thousands of people every year for the last so many years and say, but what about all these great examples, all these great wonderful people that came out of that state, that school? Don't they deserve to be also acknowledged? Why do we only look at, you know, 
once in a while somebody breaking that law, breaking that pledge or that school, then uh, generalize and say, we have to get rid of religion. I think religion is today more relevant than ever before. It is, as you are seeing it, playing a role in our politics more than ever before. It is being discussed at every level. And the easiest and shortest way to bring consensus among peoples of the world is to through religion, is to bring them through their own religion. When you bring them and say, let's play by your rules, what does your religion tell you to do? You're going to find that most of the people of the world already know what's right and what's wrong. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And we could have a faster way when we come to the things we agree on, the common things between our different faith communities worldwide, we're going to reach to a world that is peaceful, a future that is peaceful based on justice. And as long as we lose ourselves to think that we have to scrap that process and start all over again, and then what? Are we going to come up with something new and better? No. So I hope that you know you as uh, young minds looking at the world and trying to uh, make a better future for all of us to consider what religion truly plays as a role in the life of the world and how today it is playing a role. Maybe there is a difference taking place between technology that and religion being out of touch or out of date, but sooner or later it will catch up. And it could be through you that you can translate eight old traditions into something meaningful to them. Thank you so much. So we come to uh, the question and answer area. science taking center stage and helping humanity uh, establish more dependence on different products that help people live better lives, uh, do you think that religion can compete and survive into the future? And this question for you. Um, I, I think for as long as uh, um, there's been human civilization, there's been a concern that um, technology, whatever technology is, you know, whether it was the wheel, I can mean, just imagine that our, you know, our ancient ancestors, that uh, whatever sort of basic spiritual system there was um, in the, the early days of human civilization, when the wheel came around, you know, they were saying, oh, this is going to ruin it, everybody's going to worship the wheel. Next thing you know, you know, people are going to be, you know, traveling all over the place, and families are going to break up, and it's going to be awful. Um, and probably the same thing was said about the you know the telegraph and then the telephone and the radio you know where families are you know people are just sitting there glued to the radio listening to some voices coming out of the air instead of talking to each other. Um, so I, I'm going to guess that just about every generation, every iteration of uh, techno technological advance um, has been seen at some point or another as being either a threat to or in competition with um, uh, with spiritual traditions. Um, uh, one of the things about spiritual traditions, I think, that's uh, um, most excuse me, um, most important is their adaptability. Uh, and I think we have seen in the history of all three of our uh, all three of our faith traditions, and in other faith traditions as well, uh, those ideologies which have become extremely rigid in a particular period of time and said, no, these are the boundaries, and everybody has to color inside these lines, and the world has to be like this, and we have to see it this way, and nothing else is acceptable have disappeared. Those strings within our faith traditions have disappeared because, uh, and I think in, uh, um, in my own faith tradition, I would think of the Essenes, uh, who had a 
had it in their in their ideology in the um, uh, in the first century or a little before that that they were going to remove themselves from the corruption um, that was uh, um, rampant in civil and religious leadership in Jerusalem. They were going to take themselves down and live in caves along the, the southern border of the Dead Sea. Um, they were going to be celibate. They were going to be ascetic. They were just going to sit out and wait for God to come and wipe out everybody that they disagreed with. And then they would come back and reestablish the true religion. Um, and we all know what happened. They're no longer with us. Um, so I think that uh, um, the ability to look at the world as it is and say some of these things, I think it goes back, actually, I think it goes back to what I said initially, that there are, that ideas in and of themselves have no necessary positive or negative valence. It's, it's how they're used. Um, so, uh, um, you know, I was not in a hurry to um, have my son have a Facebook account. Um, um, uh, at, at, the, at the advice of one of his uh, um, uh, teenage counselors at camp, um, he, put a, he, he opened a profile, set up a profile um, when he was 12, and his counselor told him, oh, when I get the thing, this is you're 13, just click the box and say you're 13. Um, and we found out about it, and, and so for as many months as he illegally had one, uh, that's how many months after his 13th birthday he couldn't have one. Um, uh, so uh, um, hopefully that was a lesson, but I, I was I was reluctant and concerned, like every other parent. Uh, and then um, uh, seeing the reality of the world, um, we launched a Facebook page for my congregation, and I have had more opportunity to have a timely response, real time response, um, to many of my congregants, their birthdays, their anniversaries, things like that, getting through them on time. Um, uh, because they're on Facebook, then before there was a, a congregational Facebook page, um, and before I had a professional Facebook profile. Um, and probably the, 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 the most dramatic example where, on the one hand, I would say, ew, that's really kind of weird. But on the other hand, it was very meaningful for that, for that family. Um, a young couple was about to have their first child, um, and uh, um, as the baby was being born, of course, you know, Jad was on his phone, in fact, you know, posting on Facebook. And uh, when when uh, uh, when Rose was born, he, you know, here she is, took a picture, posted it on Facebook. Um, and 15 minutes after his daughter was born, I was Facebook chatting with him, congratulating him, and saying, you know, send me another picture, and she looks just like her mom, and stuff like that. But even though I couldn't physically be there with a congregant, um, uh, yet I was having a very personal and meaningful to that family conversation with them at the moment that their first child was being born. Um, uh, when I stop to think about it, when I retell the story, especially when I tell, re retell the story of people of my own age cohort or older, they, uh, they kind of look at me and go, that's good for you. How nice. <laughs> Why wasn't he with his wife? Well, he was with his wife. He was just also talking to his rabbi at the same time. It was kind of a nice thing. So I don't think that technology um, necessarily has to compete. Um, with a faith tradition, I don't think it, uh, um, it challenges um, the legitimacy of a faith tradition, um, and uh, it only becomes a problem like anything else material um, when we set it up as an idol um, and, and worship um, our iPhone more than make that more important than the people around us, or you know, um, uh, if, if you know, Farmville becomes your life rather than the people <laughs> around you, um, then you have a different kind of a problem. It's not, it's not a problem. Well, I, I think the rabbi captured it well. I, I would just say that for the king on, on one of the things he said, I think the technology, particularly in terms of, of the, the kind of interactive media that we have today, is sort of reshaping how we understand community. And I think that probably does say something about what religion needs to be able to adapt to in the future. Um, and I'm not sure religion is generally geared, most faith traditions generally geared to do that. So I think there's a big learning curve in you know, how you um, how you get involved in that kind of interactive community building that happens through technology in particular. I also think technology has a, a, a vast ability to better our lives together, which is good. Um, it all, you know, it's a simple question. Are you going to use it for good or for evil? You know, and it and it can be either way, right? So um, I think it, it has to do with the questions we ask about what 
technology is for and what, it's, what, it, what it should do. And, and one of the things I think religion in its best sense of understanding calls for is that technology serves, um, serves human need and, and creating more sustainable communities and better relationships and, um, and, and understanding um, one another more clearly. I mean, it's fascinating when you look at the, what we call the Arab Spring in the Middle East and, the, and that movement of, of the changes that have occurred. So much of that happened, you know, via Facebook and Twitter and, um, and text messaging. And it was amazing the kind of communication that happened to bring about these changes in Egypt and, uh, you know, Syria, very <coughs> a whole host of places where this thing was happening. You have to be seen sort of how that moves forward. But, um, and the Occupy movement here, certainly an interesting um, kind of interactive media relationship that's, that's created a lot of, of energy in that. So uh, lots, lots of learning, I think, to do within the faith communities and religious communities. Well, if, if, we, uh, if we're looking for the proof in the lab, okay, if we think that somehow we're going to capture uh, the existence of God on an instrument that we made, uh, I think we will fail. Because if God wanted to show us himself or reveal himself, he would have done so a long time ago, as he did to Moses. Um, but if God chooses not to, there's no way we can unless he wills it. But when we look at things, I, I was listening yesterday uh, on the radio on NPR with Terry Rose, and she was talking to a uh, Gloria who 12 years ago proved that the universe is expanding at an accelerated rate. And it's fascinating to See, well, I said, how did they measure it? How did they know? You know <coughs> they're looking at galaxies and supernovas that are so far, far away. And he won, or the team won, that Nobel Prize because not that they went out and measured it somehow, or they traveled the universe, it's because of indirect evidence. And when we talk about God and proving God, we're not going to prove God by taking a picture of God and showing it on TV. We prove God through indirect evidence. And we could not be here. <laughs> uh, yeah, when you take a picture of our Facebook. Uh, <laughs> if you uh, there's a, a, a verse in the Quran that says, and in yourself, don't you see? So if you want to know about God, look into yourself, look into how you were made, how impossibly complicated we are, that God said, if there is, if you as human beings can actually create, or you are that of creation, create a fly. A little fly, I'm just kidding. Not a human being. Uh, billions and billions of cells that develop, that have a purpose, that this genetic code, until now we don't even uh, understand this code. We can't claim we understand ourselves and how we make them. So uh, just look at yourself and say, where did I come? Well, I said no, um, and and that is that is sort of my final answer. Um, I want to follow a friend. I'd like to exercise a lifeline or whatever it is, um, because that's not the point of religion, um, and, and or or faith or spirituality, um, whatever you want to call it. You might you might call it any of those. I think there's a lot of discussion about whether those terms can be 
you know, mutually exclusive, or I, I think they're probably interchangeable. People use them sort of randomly. But the, the point is that, that it, it is about a sort of a, a decision of faith or a, or a place of faith that says, you know, I choose to believe in something other than myself and all that I can see here, that there's something beyond that. And, and that is a matter of faith, ultimately. Um, and um, the idea that you, can, that you can prove something that's a matter of faith sort of doesn't really make it faith anymore. It, it kind of makes it um, just another scientific theory that has a, a lot of backing to it. Um, the other question I think that one wants to ask is um, <clears throat> whether you say you believe in God or you say you don't believe in God, there is no God. Um, all, both of those actually require some level of faith. Um, probably the least amount of faith is the agnostic position that says, I don't know, not sure, you know, might be, might not be. Um, but there's an openness to that that's very, I think, healthy as well. Um, but to have faith there is a God or faith there is no God is actually the same function of faith um, one way or the other. It's to have an absolute sense of a, or a sense of certainty about something. Um, but the question for me that's posed is if you say I do have faith that there is a God, the most important question I think we ask is what kind of God? And I don't believe in the same God you don't believe in. Um, that much of what you don't believe about the idea of a deity, I may also not believe in. But I do believe that there is a divine, a reality of life that is divine. And um, that there is a, there is a path um, for each of us that's spiritual. Um, but can you prove that by some sort of scientific evidence? Uh, I don't think so. Thomas Aquinas had to find proofs for the existence of God. For instance, he said, you know, one of them is that there is an unmoved mover. That everything is moving and ultimately get back to something that is the unmoved mover that causes everything else to move. But ultimately to say there's an unmoved mover is an act of faith, right? He to say that there is something there. Um, I mean, the, the, the theory used to be, one of the theories used to be that the world existed on the back of a giant tortoise. You know, a huge turtle will sat on this huge turtle. And, and one scientist was debunking this, um, this idea that you know, the world was situated on this huge turtle. And this woman came up and said, you know, you're wrong. This is, this is the way it is. And the scientist said, well, OK, if that's the case, what's under the turtle? And the woman said, you can't fool me. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, faith is really sort of the, the issue of whether or not one believes in God. And the idea that we can prove in scientific, I think I agree with you, Mom, there's much of science that I think opens up the door of the magnificence and wonder and miracle of the universe. There are theories. But what's fascinating is the theory of an ever-expanding universe, exponentially expanding universe, which is quantum physics, is at odds with Newtonian physics. And quantum and Newtonian physics can't get along with each other because one has a closed universe and one has an open and expanding universe. And so the TOE, the theory of everything, is the attempt to sort of meld those together. And scientists are working on this feverishly. They haven't gotten there yet. Because it's, it, there is mystery to all of this. And there is majesty to it. And I think that can open our eyes to this idea of the divine spiritual proof I can't I can't my my father was a memory worked most of his um, adult working life in basic research uh, so I was sort of steep in the scientific method from uh, uh, from a very young age and my undergraduate degree is in the sciences um, so I feel fairly confident saying uh, responding to uh, uh, my brothers and sisters of various faith traditions including some strings within my own um, who want to dismiss say, the evolution and say it's just a theory. Um, and my response to that is gravity is just a theory too. Um, uh, you can demonstrate its presence, but you can't hand me a cup of gravity. Um, you, 
it's not something tangible. At, at some point, every good scientist, just like every good theologian, says there's a leap of faith here. There's a point at where where I look at the I look at what's before me and I and I develop a theory and I test the theory and I refine the theory based on on empirical evidence. Um, so most of what we deal with in science um, is theoretical in nature, and we just sort of hope that everything conforms, continues to conform to what we know. But if we if we said um, you know uh, if we said physics begins and ends with Isaac Newton. Um, we'd be in a lot of trouble right now because physics doesn't begin and end with Isaac Newton. Um, and we've demonstrated that it doesn't. We've demonstrated that there's not Newtonian things in the universe. And um, so we have, to, we have to keep going and guessing and believing until um, we learn more, we discover more. Um, so one of the reasons why I've never had any kind of conflict internally um, uh, or intellectually between, uh, between my, my faith and um, uh, and my my foundation in science is that uh, to me they're just two sides of the same coin. Um, uh, we'll share with you a a uh, uh, my studying for my biochemistry final when I was in college. Um, and for uh, this particular course, we had to memorize. We had to be able to reproduce all of central metabolism from memory. Um, these are the reactions, complex reactions, and shunts and bypasses. And and other reactions which take place in every body cell every day constantly, which drives the energy that makes you alive. Um, and uh, I was finished my studying, and I had written it out on blackboards. That's how long ago it was. It was blackboards. I was too chalk. Um, on, uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, Google it. Google chalk. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, on two walls of technology. I'm on two walls um, of this classroom, and uh, um, I was so proud of myself that I was able to do this. I actually signed it, um, and you're, you weren't supposed to. You were supposed to erase the boards when you left, but I was so proud of my work that I didn't erase it. And I was going to lock the classroom door so that nobody else could come in and erase it. So I knew it would at least be there overnight. Um, and as I was walking out, locking the classroom door, taking one look back before I turned out the lights at my handiwork, I realized that's not my handiwork. I, I had nothing to do with that. That is such a complex and elegant system that I think I understand it, but I couldn't reproduce it really. I mean, I could reproduce it from memory. I could write all this stuff down, but if I had to build it from scratch, I wouldn't know where to start. Um, and it was one of the most profoundly spiritual moments of my life. Was that a proof of the existence of God? No but it was a humbling moment where I realized the universe is a lot more complicated and elegant place than I'll ever understand. Thank you. Do you think taking religion out of the schools is a factor to the diminished moral compass in some of our youth? And in that, do you think that there should be a stronger ethics for moral and manners uh, for in school? Um, I'm as, I'm as, as uh, um, committed uh, a practitioner of the faith tradition, I think, as, as, uh, um, as you'll find. Uh, I'm also as committed a civil libertarian as you'll find. Um, uh, I, I feel extremely strongly that um, the wall between religion and state um, should be as, as uh, thick and as high and as impregnable as you can possibly make it, um, uh, because uh, one of the things that has made this country great and continues to make this country great, um, even even though at times we've tried to make that wall permeable, more permeable than, than at other times, uh, is that no one particular faith tradition uh, has its say in public school curriculum. Uh, we have freedom of religion in this country, which means if you want to teach your particular theology or ideology, you can set up your own school and you can do it, uh, provided that you also give the, uh, um, the general education that every child is, is guaranteed um, in a free and open society. Uh, um, now that may seem to be at odds with what I was saying initially about, you know, about morals and ethics and things like that, and we need to, we need to instill those. Um, but I think you've heard all three of us say that people of goodwill, um, who are sincere practitioners of their faith, um, are more concerned about their own behavior um, than, than imposing their ideas on other people. Um, uh, what's the best way for me as a teacher? Um, 
whether it's within the context of my faith tradition or otherwise, what's the best way for me to convey moral and ethical principles with the example of my life? Um, and if I'm busy trying to instill my particular perspective at you know, my school, my door, my, my way of doing things, if I'm busy trying to persuade other people that this is the right way to achieve the same thing that every other faith tradition does uh, or seeks to achieve, um, then I'm shortchanging uh, the, the, the people I'm trying to teach. Um, so, it, and I'm going to talk and contradict myself. Um, the unfortunate thing is that um, uh, uh, faith is not, doesn't find its way into, um, into education. Um, the belief that um, compassion, that those basic important human principles don't find their way in. Um, I don't think that's because um, we make a separation between religion and, and government or religion and state in, in the United States. Um, I think that's because, because I think we can, an entirely religious school can produce incredibly intolerant people and, and have, um, uh, not only in this country, but worldwide. Um, so I, I don't think it's the absence of religion so much as it is the, um, the absence of those principles which every faith tradition teaches. You don't need to have anybody's particular faith tradition injected into the public school system to teach those principles. Um, the challenge for, uh, for teachers in any situation is to imbue students with those ideas without framing them in a specific, um, in a specific context. Here, here's the problem uh, from my perspective. There, there is a myth that once upon a time um, we were this deeply religious nation um, because uh, somebody said a perfunctory prayer in a classroom uh, on a morning um, from a Christian perspective generally. By the way, I have a strong, um, well, it's more than a hunch. I know for a fact that uh, there were never Jewish prayers offered. There were never Islamic prayers offered before Hindu or Buddhist or any other tradition for that matter. This was a prayer in the name of Jesus um, put upon those who came to the classroom. And while we were doing that, we were hanging thousands of African Americans in the public square unceremoniously and uh, based on a horrible kind of racism. Um, while we were doing that, we were incarcerating large numbers of people, especially the film industry during the 1960s, under McCarthy's era, uh, naming them as communists, many of them from a Jewish background, um, and that's no coincidence, I think. Um, and while we have had this propensity of great religious fervor in this country, um, uh, following 9-11, some of the most strident voices that I heard for the destruction of the Islamic community came from uh, the far right religious Christian movements in our country. So my problem is that this notion that somehow saying a perfunctory prayer out of your particular tradition, and I can say this as a Christian, um, is going to somehow give you a moral compass um, is not the case within American religion. And that's what I would call American civil religion. It's the, it's the trappings of religion without the depth of, as the rabbi said, the call to compassion, um, to transformation, to, to hearing and understanding one another as human beings and recognizing the humanity of the other. Um, religion is often a, a, a lightly coding veneer of ways to mask our worst biases and prejudice and bigotry um, and often this kind of conversation that happens still in our country is really a way to say, I want to re-institute a kind of Christian dominance within this society in that method of Christianity, which doesn't really root out the depth of Christian understanding, of compassion, of grace, of kindness, of hope, of peace. Um, so, so if that's what we're talking about, um, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely opposed to reinstituting that kind of um, what I would call fake religious um, kind of uh, fervor within the public sphere. 
Um, I also am a strong proponent of the clear separation of church and state in that the state, which is a, which runs the, the public education system, um, is not to either, according to the first amendment, uh, establish religion um, nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. And I think you, you do that if you participate in this kind of, of activity uh, often, unfortunately. Now so, I've made friends. Okay, good. Um, I, I apologize, but I do have to leave. I've got a class to teach back in my day job. So, um, I, I would agree with both of my colleagues. And uh, they can look at the question again. Uh, if we mean by teaching some civics where the civics come from the common values that exist in all religions, I have no problem with that. As long as we don't call it religion and we don't call it particular religion. So the public schools are not the place to promote <coughs> particular religion. But I do not disagree with the idea that it would be useful to have uh, a civics course or uh, activity that encourages good moral values that are common to all religions without getting into belief, such as you know being truthful, being compassionate, being forgiving. You know. We need as human beings to practice that. We're not going to learn it. And, and I say it because I assume that not all people in this country go to a church, a synagogue, or a mosque, or other places of worship. Uh, a good percentage go no, nowhere on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, or any other day of the week. So, and many parents really themselves are at loss what to give to their children. And they count on the school to do uh, some level of education. So in that respect, if, and that's a big if because it's very hard to get so many religions or representatives of religions to agree on something like this, but if uh, there was a set of common values that we all accept as a society to be good and noble, that would be put in a class or activity that uh, young children would learn, so that we would have good citizens, we would have uh, you know, more individuals. I have no problem with that. Now, on, on that subject, uh, how do you see the role that religion plays in politics, especially now with elections? Is that good, bad? What about When candidates, they wear the religion of their sleeve and they try to attract uh, people of a particular faith uh, because they know the buzzwords, you know, what to say in order to get more votes. Uh, I, I see a big problem with that. Uh, because often it is directed at offending everybody else in the country. And we have seen that uh, recently in the debates uh, among the Republican candidates, how many of them have no problem saying uh, they, they want nothing to do with Islam. You know, Muslim, no matter how qualified, could or should apply for you know public service, and uh, that's because not necessarily they believe in it or understand it. It's because they are pandering to uh, some of their constituents who have certain level of ignorance about Islam, and I know that that happened before. Uh, you know when. JFK was uh, running for office, how you know, oh, he's Catholic. And it's happening now with 
Mitt Romney and Trump Huntsman about their faith. So I think whoever runs for public service, for public office, should not be subjected to a religious fitness test and it should be just his or her qualifications for the job. And because when they go to do the job and they you know, give their oath to fulfill that position's mandate, they're not uh, there to teach us about their religion or to convert us to their religion. So it's irrelevant what religion they belong to. In my I would just add that uh, it's vitally important in, in, in my perspective for thoughtful Americans, informed voters, to explode the myths that are passed off as, as factual. Uh, I, I want to jump out of my skin every time I hear a reference to um, the Founding Fathers and sort of um, this anachronistic reference that somehow they fall within a particular uh, a, a particular ideology in contemporary, um, in contemporary religion, specifically contemporary Christianity. Um, yeah. These are clearly folks who, who first of all, um, uh, are not strongly committed to um, the free exercise clause in the First Amendment, um, because that's what those guys fought for. Um, I mean, they, they wrote that. That's what they said, you know, free exercise. Um, um, and second of all, um, they clearly haven't done their own work on the history of, of those founding fathers, a number of whom were deists, um, and uh, um, did not subscribe to a specific church or denomination or ideology. Um, uh, were, you know, were deep believers in, in, a, uh, in a deity, in a divine force in the universe, uh, but were not necessarily um, committed to a particular denomination. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the, 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 the idea that somehow, it's kind of echoing what, what, what Brian had said just a little while ago, that, that somehow a particular stream of faith um, represents the authentic American values is, uh, is not only misleading, it's, it's actually false. Now, what do you think about homosexual rights in relationships? Especially in our current. I guess I can go first time. We're playing ping pong here. Um, you know, I, I, heard a, I heard a very interesting, uh, well, and, and actually I also want to add, because I wrote this down, I wrote down something that, that Imam Bushri said, and I wrote down something that Reverend Fulwiger said for that I can steal them and use them later on, with attribution, of course, that was it, that I heard it from them. Um, uh, um, and it, it really struck me something that, that Brian said, you know, he, he said, Jesus never excluded anyone. Um, and, and one has to wonder if the, um, you know, if the primary prophets of anybody's faith tradition um, would respond in the way that adherence to those faith traditions today are responding in the name of those prophets. Um, uh, you know, I mean, with with the, with the sort of behaviors um, and condemnation being done in in the name of those faith traditions, um, I, I can't imagine I can't imagine um, uh, uh, Jesus picketing the funeral of a soldier who fell in service of the country. Um, that just doesn't seem like a Jesus thing to me. And, you know, I'm, I'm I'm Jewish. I'm a rabbi. Maybe I don't know, but that that just doesn't seem to be consistent with with what I've read in the Christian scriptures um, and what I've learned from my Christian brothers and sisters uh, uh, in the clergy and the laity as well. Um, uh, that, that having been said, um, uh, another thing which is troubling for me um, as a Jew, and particularly as uh, um, I represent the conservative movement in Judaism, which is a capital C, it has nothing to do with our politics or, or our, our social agenda. Um, it has to do with um, conserving tradition while adapting to modernity. That's where the that comes from. So, when I say I'm a conservative Jew, it's not the same as saying I'm a conservative Christian. It means something uh, very different. We have politically conservative people in our movement. We have politically liberal people in our movement and everything in between. Um, uh, with that caveat, uh, particularly from the perspective of the conservative movement, um, uh, we tend to read our sacred text uh, in a, a literary historical way, um, it, meaning that we're not literalists. Um, and and uh, one of the one of the major 
in fractions when I was in rabbinical school um, was a narrow or decontextualized reading of anything at all. Um, uh, the phrase that was used by my teachers is you are doing violence to the text um, by ripping something out of its context um, and um, interpreting it in a narrow way. You're cutting off all the meaning, um, you're honing it down, you're turning it into something that it's not and it never was intended to be. Um, all that to say when people point to um, uh, two verses in the book of Leviticus, um, and which are really one verse phrased two different ways, um, slightly different ways, um, and um, turn that into a blanket condemnation of all human beings who find themselves um, uh, attracted to members of the same sex, um, I, I don't understand it. Uh, because first of all, when I read that text in Hebrew, it doesn't say what you think it says. Um, uh, second of all, when I put it in its fuller context, it means something else, um, or it's referring to uh, um, something else as well. Um, there's, uh, um, there are literally volumes of commentary on that section of the book of Leviticus um, in, in my tradition, um, and there is uh, um, universal agreement that it's ambiguous, and it was deliberately ambiguous, and so a lot of the traditional um, uh, hesitation about um, uh, uh, same-sex relationships in Judaism is a hedge, because we don't understand it. Um, we really don't understand it. Um, in, in our modern world, where we understand a lot more about human sexuality and human psychology um, uh, and, uh, um, and, and things like that, we should be reinterpreting our understanding of that. Um, something which was never in, in any interpretation, no matter how, uh, how much you were trying to hedge just in case it was really saying what we thought it said, um, something which is never in any of those is the denial of the fundamental rights of human beings to um, to people for any reason whatsoever. Um, and uh, uh, every faith tradition has some version of saying when a person is behaving badly, even if we assume for the sake of argument that homosexuality is, is sinful behavior, and I don't assume that and I frankly don't believe it. Um, uh, the, even if we assume that's so, um, nowhere in my tradition does it say, therefore, this person is less than a human being and should be treated as less than a human being. It should be denied basic rights, it should be denied compassion, it should be denied understanding, it should be denied justice and, and, and everything else. Um, so again, there is, uh, uh, I don't want to present myself as, as representing all of the spectrum of, of belief and, and uh, an ideology within Judaism, uh, but I think it's safe to say that the mainstream, the back part of the bell curve, getting wider um, all the time, uh, would say that um, the mere fact that someone has to um, uh, has to even agitate for their basic civil rights um, because of their sexual preference or because of, of what they do behind closed doors with consenting adults um, is is baffling. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 why should you even have to deal with workplace discrimination because of what you do in your private life, which harms no one. Um, uh, um, even if I am from a part of an ideology which says it's sinful, but I would say, why should you have to battle for your civil rights with something you do in private with a consenting adult, which only harms you? <coughs> um, you know, I, I, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I can't be fired from my job because, um, or denied certain things because, you know, I don't eat well. Um, you know, that. That's harmful to me. Um, the person who is cooking meals for me that are that are unhealthy is, is doing things which are harmful for me. Um, there's no question about whether or not that's has any impact on my civil rights. Uh, 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 in terms of uh, you know the, the, the kinds of things like you know I mean, uh, marriage benefits, things like that. Um, Personally, I, my, my reaction would be, again, from, from the perspective of, I think, any faith tradition. Um, if one human being wants to take on responsibility for the welfare of another human being, um, why is there any reason under civil law to deny that? Um, uh, if one human being loves another human being and says, and, and, and says I want you to be responsible for um, the kinds of decisions that 
need to be made for me if I'm incapable of making them for myself, um, what does it matter, the gender or the relationship, if it's a brother or a sister or a parent, um, a spouse, a friend, it, 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 why should that matter? Why is the compassion that one person has for another based on something else? Even if I disapprove of that relationship, um, even if I think that relationship is a sinful one, that's a separate issue to me anyway from whether or not the basic love and compassion between two human beings can be exercised within the, within the context of civil law. Um, I think it's well said. Uh, I want to also borrow something that uh, I have in mind said earlier about which are the, really the real issues versus the contentious issues that we focus on today as a society. Um, in the sphere of religion, uh, homosexuality is one small potato. It's a small issue. It is not, does not define necessarily the person if he is of the faith or not of the faith. It doesn't say anywhere in Islam that, you know, uh, for a person to be a Muslim, they have to be this and this, and explicitly says they cannot be uh, someone who is uh, homosexual. So that's not uh, on a condition list anywhere. We are also in a conservative tradition where we uh, believe that this is a sinful act. It's, uh, it's not the norm. We do not encourage it or approve of it. But again, we do not become the judges that uh, say we have a specific uh, way of dealing with it. And uh, this is between that person and, and God. We're going to answer to God. You know, there are so many things people do in their lives. They have to. Uh, you know, eventually answer to God, it's not my business. Uh, so, when I meet a person and they profess to me that they believe in God, I take it, I take what they say, uh, face value. I do not say, but let me test you based on your attitude towards, you know, human sexuality. So a person could be a strong believer in God and be homosexual at the same time. Uh, someone could be a strong believer in God and be a drug addict. Do we encourage people to you know, become drug addicts? No. We will do anything and everything to prevent that. Uh, but that's something they happen to in or practice in their life, but it does not negate the fact that they still, in their spirituality, in their mental capacity, believe in God and uh, are compassionate and are good people and want to do a lot of good things. Okay? So we're going to look at the big picture and not uh, take one single issue and generalize it in them a person, male or female, because of their. Uh, you know, sexual choice, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid that in in society today we have these buzz issues that uh, we want to you know uphold and condemn people based on their attitude toward these issues, homosexuality, abortion, blah blah blah, and not based on who they are. We only have time for one last question, and I think this is a good one to close our conversation. What is the most important thing society can certain or attain from religion today? Religion, all religions have rich history of human development of values. They have tested these values. They have tried them in different times, in different parts of the world. And in, so we could actually look back at this rich heritage and 
uh, benefit tremendously from it instead of trying to start from scratch. And uh, world religions have, you know, survived for thousands of years because they have great value, because uh, they will outlast any government and any state or empire that we know of. So uh, if there is life 1,000 years or 10,000 years from now, I believe there will be Judaism, there will be Christianity, there will be Islam, and there will be many other religions. They will be probably even more defined and have richer experience, but they will be there. Long after us and after our systems that we develop today. So, uh, religion uh, adds another dimension to our conversation, to our thinking. Uh, it injects uh, God as a higher <coughs> being, and that really enriches the entire uh, way of looking at our issues and not simplify them to be just human-centric issues that uh, are without meaning or without that. That's, that's uh, um, I think that says, says it all, of course, I'm going to say something else because I'm the clergy and that's what we do. But um, no, I would, I would really only just to add that I think what, um, what religion has to offer, um, what it's always had to offer and what it still has to offer today and again into the future, um, is the value of uh, living a life which is based on love and compassion, on humility and on service. Um, and uh, um, every one of those things is something that um, we can all develop more of in our, in our own selves and our own lives and uh, the world can use more of. So you know, we, are, we are the world, as, uh, as the old song went. Um, and uh, um, uh, each one of us is uh, responsible for the other. If we want to build a more just and peaceful and compassionate world, then um, we have to live more just and peaceful and compassionate lives, and that message will always be will always be necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we are planning other events, um, not pretty much in the end of the semester, but now it's going to segue into uh, spring semester. So if you have your email that you registered uh, for this event. We'll keep you up to date on different things. Uh, there's two more interfaith uh, panels scheduled for next semester, one in uh, February and one in March. Uh, one in February dealing with religion and science in a more elaborate conversation. And then uh, the third one is religion and democracy, especially coming down close to the elections, how that is going. So we elaborate more about what we discussed today. So thank you for coming, and we want to thank the volunteers from the organization.